that, let's kick off and get started. I just have to do one thing. Start the recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome to class. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. I almost forgot my title there for a second. Uh, I'm excited about this class the, this week. So we have three classes on this topic this week, and we're looking at the Supreme Court. We're looking at the Supreme Court to understand how it works, but also the big cases that are going to be in the news at the end of the month, at the end of June and early July, because the Supreme Court is hearing these cases right now and making their decisions. So we're going to do a little bit of walkthrough of how the court works and then dive into four top cases to unpack. And to do all this great work, we're here with one of our top scholars, Tom Donnelly from the National Constitution Center. So Tom, I know you're excited to jump into this, but I'm going to ask you this one kind of tee off question as we start off. How out of all the last like 10 years of Supreme Court cases and kind of the year in review of cases, how like intense is this year or how popular is this year for people to pay attention to? There are some, so, you know, each term has, a, a, you know, a, a mix of, of, you know, high profile cases, low profile cases. I would say this term had like the, the high profile cases, this term are genuine blockbusters and it's a really highly anticipated term where people are expecting really big decisions. That's not true. Like, you know, it's not true literally every term, but I'd say every three or four years or, or, or so, you'll have a term like this where there's really two or three big cases that people are following very, very closely. Uh, and this, this feels like it's a good list, but a really interesting list. So let's, let's begin with a foundation. So we're all on the same page about you know, how the court is supreme, and we're really focused on the Supreme Court here, but the lower courts definitely come into play, how the Supreme Court works, who's on the Supreme Court, because um, we just had a new Supreme Court nomination process, but uh, the new justice isn't on yet. So at the, during this term and during this year, this is our Supreme Court class photo. So Tom, why don't you walk us through kind of who these justices are, and then we'll dive into our new justice that will be beginning at the end of this term. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is, if you, if you go right to the middle of the picture here, you have the uh, number one is the Chief Justice, John Roberts, who was appointed by George W. Bush in 2005. And then right there, uh, as I'm looking at it to the left at number two is Justice Clarence Thomas, who was appointed in 1991 by uh, President Ger George Herbert Walker Bush. And if you go right next to the Chief on the other side, Number three is Justice Stephen Breyer, who was appointed in 1994 by President Clinton, is actually retiring at the end of this term. And then if we go sweep all the way to the end there to number four, uh, it's, it's Justice uh, Samuel Alito, appointed in 2006 by President George W. Bush. And then all the way to the end of the row there, number five is Justice Sonia Sotomayor, uh, appointed by President Obama in 2009. And then we go to the top row, where number six, is Justice Elena Kagan appointed in 2010 uh, by President Barack Obama. Right next to her is uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, who was appointed in 2017 by President Trump. Number eight on the end of the row on the other side is Justice Brett Kavanaugh appointed in 2018 by President Trump. And then the last justice there is number nine, Justice Amy Coney Barrett appointed in 2020 by President Trump. And these positions are all determined by seniority. So once just as Breyer leaves, everyone will shift where they are in the class photo. So when we do this next year, you'll see everyone's going to be in a different spot. So Justice Kagan will finally get to the front row, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now she'll she'll hop up to the front row. Because I always joke that we I can say like clearly we don't do this by size and height. I'm like yeah. this is all you like. This wasn't a Kagan. photographer coming up with the, like the best composition. <laughs> exactly. Like Kagan and Gorsuch beside each other makes that really evident. Um, and now I wonder. How, uh, the Justice um, Jackson, her height, I'm not actually sure how tall she'll be, so we'll see. So Justice Jackson will kind of shift and take up that spot nine. Is that correct? Exactly. Yep, that's exactly right. Perfect. So kind of laying out, looking at the justice, thank you for also pointing out to us who appointed them and kind of when they were in the process as well, because I think that's an interesting conversation we hear in the news. But what if, uh, like, before we even dive into that, a lot of people talk about that all the time. Oh, this person was, you know, chosen by a Republican president. This chosen person was chosen by a, a liberal president or a Democratic president. What's the role of the court? And how, do, how does that political leaning of the president affect the justices? 
Well, that's a hotly debated topic in political science. Uh, but, you know, in the end, what we look to in the Constitution is this process is set up where it's in Article 2, Section 2. It's the appointment power of the president. And what the text says is the president shall, quote, nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. And so it's there that we see this, this process of how justices are ending up on the Supreme Court. And, you know, what, what you'll see over time is justices, because of Article 3, they have what's called life tenure. So they serve for, for life. So they serve basically until they decide to retire or die. The only way to remove a justice before then is through impeachment and removal, which no one, no justice has ever been removed by that process. The only justice ever impeached in the history of our country was Justice Samuel Chase during the Jefferson administration. So it's been a really, really long time since that's happened. Well, what you end up seeing is that because of the combination of life tenure and the presidential appointment power is there's no set number of justices each president gets to appoint. And so it varies quite a bit from presidency to presidency. Fantastic. Um, and thank you for kind of unpacking that because we, we definitely want to talk about not just how, how the courts are you know, in the news with the cases they come down, but how the courts are discussed in the news as well and how we can truly understand the constitution and how it's set up. Now, when we, we dive into that and we can dive into article three in a minute, but can you help us out and do kind of some, you know, I love when we do vocabulary time. So is that like a minute on vocabulary time? Can we talk about what is judicial review, judicial supremacy and judicial independence? Sure. So judicial review is well, when we think about what's the big power the Supreme Court has, it's this power of judicial review. That's the power of the court to review the constitutionality of acts of the national government, state governments, local governments, where the Supreme Court gets the power to say something's constitutional or unconstitutional. If you're looking for really good discussions of judicial review in American history, the most famous one outside of the Supreme Court was by Alexander Hamilton. His Federalist Paper number 78 in many ways is the strongest defense of judicial review's place in our constitutional system and its legitimacy. And then for the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court affirms its power of judicial review in the famous case of Marbury versus Madison of 1803, written by Chief Justice John Marshall. So that's judicial review. It's a really big deal. It's when, we, again, when we're getting cases where the Supreme Court's saying something's constitutional or unconstitutional, they are exercising the power of judicial review. Judicial supremacy is sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a different uh, idea, which is some people argue that the Supreme Court is the final voice on questions of whether actions by the national government or state governments are constitutional. And so this is saying the Supreme Court gets a final say. So some people argue that. Others counter that the Supreme Court may have the power of judicial review, but in the end, the Supreme Court itself doesn't settle the, the, with finality, constitutional questions. We can still debate them as citizens. The political branches can still debate them. We, the people, can still get together and advance constitutional amendments to sometimes reverse the decisions of the Supreme Court. So there are various ways in which there's constitutional dialogue going, going on between the Supreme Court, the political branches, and the American people. And so the debate over su judicial su uh, supremacy is about how much we think the Supreme Court can settle about the Constitution's meaning versus how much more debate there can be after the Supreme Court has decided something. So that's judicial review, judicial supremacy. The other big idea is judicial independence. We already said a little bit about this, but this is the idea that the federal courts must be independent from the control of the political branches. And so again, this is done by giving judges and justices life tenure, guaranteeing their salaries. Judges can only be removed through the impeachment and removal process. Part of the reason that founders did this was because as, as colonists here in America, they had judges that were totally beholden to the British crown. And so those judges relied for their position and their salary on the king, on parliament. And because of that, when we created our new constitution, we said, we don't like that system. We want, we want impartial justice. We want no bias in the judicial system. We want independent judges to exercise their independent judgment without political influence. And so we get that with judicial independence. Fantastic. Thank you for walking us through that. And I really appreciate the way you explain judicial supremacy, because it's almost like the court has a final word on the case that they're looking at. But that doesn't mean the dialogue stops around the country, because there's other factors that add, edit, and change the Constitution, um, like a 28th Amendment and things like that. So thank you, and laws as well. So thank you very much for that. Do you want to dive into looking at where the courts get their power? in Article 3, and we'll talk about how the courts work 
Um, and the Hub Goods class already asked a great question, so I'll weave it into it when we talk about how the courts work. How civil discourse is so unbelievably important for how the courts work and the Supreme Court in particular? Absolutely. Should we start with Article 3 and then and go from there, Curry? Always great to start with the Constitution. Absolutely. So Article 3, it's an interesting part of the Constitution because it's, it can read as really technical. It's also fairly short. So if you compare Article 3 to like Article 1, which sets out Congress, it's really Article 1 for Congress is really long. Article 3 on the judiciary is very short. But Article 3 vests the judicial power of the United States in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress from time to time uh, may ordain and establish. And so here what it's saying is one, Article 3 sets up the judicial branch of the United States. It's headed by one Supreme Court. The judicial branch is responsible for interpreting the laws. What we see there already from the first sentence of Article 3 is that the Constitution gives Congress a lot of power to shape what our federal court system is going to look like. So what can Congress do? Congress, it's up to Congress whether or not we're going to have lower federal courts. So we're going to have to have a Supreme Court, but whether we have any courts below the Supreme Court at the national level, totally up to Congress. We could have just had a Supreme Court and all state courts, but instead Congress does set up a federal court system. Congress also does things like set the number of justices on the Supreme Court, and that's changed over time. It, it was last set in the 1860s, which is why we have nine justices now, but it's been as many as 10, as few as five. And so that number has gone up and down over time. But Article 3 more broadly, Curry, as you read through it, what you really see there is so much of what the Supreme Court does is set by practice, sort of by, by practice, Supreme Court practice over time, and laws passed by Congress. Um, you know, everything from, you know, how the, how the Supreme Court's going to organize its term, uh, again, like I said, to whether or not there's going to be lower federal courts at all, how many judges there's going to be in the national court system, all these sorts of things end up being set by, on the one hand, Supreme Court practice for how the Supreme Court operates, but also by laws passed by Congress based on what the structure of the courts are going to look like. So it's a really interesting part of the Constitution that set, it settles certain things. We did want a national court system. We did want a Supreme Court, but how it was really going to look and how it was going to be, how it was going to operate was something that was really left for future generations. Fantastic. And I love that how you point out it's not just how it's spelled out in the laws of the Constitution, but it's democratic norms as well, which, you know, we talk in this class a lot over the course of the years about what are the rules that we agree upon when looking at the Constitution, when having a civil dialogue, and then what are the norms of behavior that we also follow as well. So really fascinating around that. Now, I can't wait to get to the four cases, but before we do that, how do these four cases get to the Supreme Court? So it's not like the Supreme Court goes in and cherry picks things going on in the country. It's almost like they're passive in some sense. It has to begin with the people, correct? Yeah, it has to be a genuine case in controversy. It has to be someone bringing a claim saying that, you know, the, the, that the certain, uh, in the case of constitutional cases, that the Constitution has been violated. So a, a lot of times what you see are that these constitutional cases, the big blockbuster cases we're, we're following at the end of the term, it starts with we the people, or even me the individual going to court and saying, the government has violated my constitutional rights in a certain way. And so what happens is that we see cases bubble up from, let's just take the, the federal court system, the national court system, it begins with in the district court. So that's that first layer in the, in the national courts. There are 94 district courts in the country. And you'll hear your, and your case is generally going to be heard be, be, before a single judge presiding over the case. That judge makes a decision. The losing party can then decide to appeal it. So say that no district court, I thought, think you got it wrong. I want to go to the next level of court system. And so that next level of courts are called the courts of appeals. There are 12 circuit courts in this country. Um, they have no, and, and so these are just, you know, usually what's going to happen, uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's 13 circuit courts over, over, overall and 12 geographic circuits. So there's one called the federal circuit, which is located in Washington, D.C. is the 13th. And this layer of court system now hears appeals from the district courts. Usually what you'll do is you'll have your case heard before a three judge panel in the courts of appeals. They'll make a decision. And then from there, once the circuit courts of appeals are done with your case, if you've lost, you can decide to petition the Supreme Court to hear your case. So this is known as a petition for a writ of certiorari. And so you're going to explain to the court why the court should take your case. And ever since 1925, the Supreme Court has really broad discretion, has broad power to decide whether, yes, I'm going to take a case or no, I'm not going to take a case. Because in the end, the Supreme Court looks at itself and says, 
It's not our job to hear every case. It's not even our job to correct every mistake made by the lower courts. Instead, we have to choose cases that are particularly important to the nation and to the lower court system. And so what the court's usually looking for in a new case is one, is it an issue of national importance? If it is, then the Supreme Court may grant that case. But another criteria they're looking at is whether or not there are the lower courts have come out in different ways on a constitutional issue. So maybe one circuit says X, one circuit says Y, the Supreme Court may step in in that case saying that we don't want the law applying differently in different parts of the country. So the Supreme, we, the Supreme Court, are going to set one rule for all courts to follow. And so the Supreme Court receives this petition for a writ of certiorari, and then they, they read the petition, they discuss it as a conference of judges, justices, and if four out of the nine justices say we want this case, the Supreme Court hears argument in it. So it's not a majority. It's only four of nine. It's known as the rule of four. But if the courts, if four of the justices say we want to hear this case, then it ends up on the Supreme Court docket, and they and they hear it, and ultimately, you know, by the end of June, in almost all cases, they're going to decide it then. Fantastic. And I love when you hear things like, oh, this is out of the Third Circuit when they're talking about cases and where they came from. And, you know, this map was one of the best gifts that anybody gave me when I first started working at the National Constitution Center, because then you can kind of see where the cases are coming out of and kind of where they're coming from as well. So it's helpful to kind of unpack the vocabulary that you hear when you hear these court cases being talked about in the news, because it is sometimes you said this before we started, Tom, and I think it's a really good point. Sometimes it feels like, a, you know, a team or a club that you're not a part of and you hear all these weird words and, you know, lingo. And then when you really break down the process, it's not that complicated, but it definitely has its own vernacular. So very helpful to kind of work our way through this. Now, say it gets through rule of four, they hear it. How do they, how does the Supreme Court justice really prepare for it? Because these cases are the variety of cases that they do here in that 65 to 7 to 100 are crazy different. And it feels like sometimes Supreme Court, Supreme Court justices have to be experts in, you know, this year in not just the constitutional law, but biology um, and so many other factors and ideas, too. Yeah, so I mean, the vast majority of cases they're hearing are not constitutional cases. You're right, Curry. They could be like really obscure statutes, like laws passed that are really technical, and the justices themselves are not experts in a lot of those areas. And the one thing I'll emphasize on this screen before we leave it, Curry, is look at how few cases the Supreme Court grants. It gets between 7,000 and 10,000 petitions from people to hear their cases per year. It only hears 60 to 100. Lately, it's been closer to 60. So it's a really small number of all of those petitions they're hearing. How do they decide these cases, whether the really important ones or the really technical ones they may not know a lot about ahead of time? Well, the parties, the people, the, the two part, the two, the, the parties in the case, the people opposed to one another in the case, file what are known as briefs, which are really just like little booklets. Uh, there, great picture of them right there, Curry. The different colors mean different things, but I mean the justices basically have these booklets and they're just reading these little booklets time and, uh, you know, over time. And so a lot of, you know, we've asked Justice Breyer, you know, he's been at the Constitution Center many times, what's it like being a Supreme Court justice? Well, you have to like to read a lot because <laughs> you get, you have to just you receive the arguments on each side in these written briefs. And so you do a lot of work there and, and the justices have clerks they talk to, the clerks write memos about the legal issues. There's a lot of discussion within each justice's chambers before oral argument. And so there's a lot of reading. Then, the, then the each, each party will get a chance to argue before the Supreme Court in what's known as oral arguments. They don't get a lot of time. So, I mean, for each case, it's usually under two hours that the sides are arguing. So these are cases that have often extended on for years, and they get their two hours there before the Supreme Court, roughly like a little under an hour for each side, and they get to make their case before the Supreme Court there in oral arguments. And the justices themselves get to ask questions, and they get to really test what they think are the strongest and weakest part of each party's arguments. And also, you know, in a lot of cases, and especially I'd say in the technical cases that the justices may not know as much about, there may just be the things that the justices were unclear in the briefing, and they can actually just use it as a conversation with the lawyers to make sure that they're understanding the issues well. And so then this oral argument, and then after oral argument, the justices meet in what's known as their conference. And so this is a private meeting of just the justices. There's no clerks, no staff, no one's in there. It's just the justices in this room. And they go around the table for each case that they hear an oral argument on, and each person can say how they're coming out in the case and why. And so it's a discussion around the table there. And at the end, each justice will vote, beginning with the chief justice and going down 
in seniority. And so they are, that's where they're doing the, the primary work of deciding how the case is going to come out. Once it does, if the chief justice is in the majority in the case, the chief justice assigns who's going to write the majority opinion. If the chief justice isn't, then the senior most justice in the majority decides who's going to write the majority opinion. And then so after conference, it's just months and months after that, where the justices are writing their opinions, sharing it with one another, exchanging memos, suggesting revisions, and then either saying yes or no to each opinion, the justice has to, each justice has to say, yes, I join the majority, no, I'm going to dissent, and decide how they're going to come out in a given case. When we're talking about judicial opinions at the Supreme Court, or really any court, there are three main kinds. There's the majority opinion, which is the opinion written by the justices in the majority that are really uh, saying one, what the judgment of the, what the ruling in the case is and why. You'll have dissenting opinions in some cases where justices disagree with the majority and they use their dissenting opinions to explain why they can't join the majority. And there are things called concurring opinions, which are instances where a justice may agree with the way the majority is coming out, but may have additional thoughts or additional ways of thinking about the case that they share in those concurring opinions. As we've seen throughout the year in our class, sometimes the dissenting opinions and concurring opinions are more important than the majority opinion over time because they explain something particularly well or inspire future justices and future generations to reconsider how to read the Constitution. So it's a reminder, if you really care about a case, read all the opinions. Yeah, I think that's so important. And just because I know we're going to get into this with uh, one of the big four cases that we're looking at, but the opinions are, you know, when I got my doctorate, my head professor told me over and over and over again, writing is iterative, iterative. So it changes over and over and you're drafting and you're redrafting and you're going through. So this opinion, I always, when I first read this, and I know that, I knew that about writing, you always think like the opinions are done like in a week, but they're really done over a long period of time. And that's a part of the process to get, to see, can they talk each other into changing sides or they, can they talk each other into being on the side of the, you know, as Warren says, the magic five, or is it going to be nine zero? Is it going to be seven two? So how much does that, versions of the rewriting and how long does that typically take? It really varies. You know, you would say for a, 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 a relatively easier case that's, you know, unanimous on the Supreme Court, it takes about three months to get through the process. You know, for a really, for a really hot button case, a, a blockbuster, it could be argued in October and decided at the end of the next June. So it really can vary quite a bit. Um, you know, and through this process, history suggests sometimes justices change their mind based on how opinions are written. I wouldn't say that it doesn't happen all the time. It's not like a, 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 you know, it's not the most likely thing that happens, but there certainly are instances where justices will change their mind, go from the majority to the dissent or the dissent to the majority. So that happens over time. But this process is especially important in really, you know, from the perspective of the majority or the dissent, the justices coming together around an opinion they could all sign on to. And hopefully over time through exchanging comments and revisions, make it a better opinion. Um, part of it too, though, is, the majority opinion may circulate first, then the dissent may, might circulate to the justices as well. And then the majority will have an opportunity to read the dissent and respond to it in the majority opinion. And so even the opinions themselves, as they're circulating, end up being in dialogue by the end, which requires each side to address the best positions advanced by the other side. Fantastic. Now let's get into those four. The only other last thing that happens is the announcement. And these four cases haven't been announced yet. So they're in the drafting phase of the opinions um, and the courts are deciding and discussing. There's no more oral, oral arguments being heard on any of these cases. Is there, Tom? No, oral argument generally ends in the middle of April. And so the justices have about uh, two and a half months to get all of their opinions, the, the remaining opinions done. So they're, they're writing a lot and revising a lot right now as we speak. I think that's the other thing Justice Breyer said, he's like, you like, have to like to read you have to like to write and you have to like to listen. They were like those three big things he said that they do as jobs. Okay, cases to watch. Now here are the big four that we're gonna go over. There's more than this that are coming out, but we thought these four are the big ones that are gonna be in the news and that you might find really interesting. So let's dive in first with Carson v. Macon. So Carson v. Macon, it's a, it's a First Amendment religion clause case, it takes place in Maine. So some, it's, it's, a, it's a weird set of facts in a way, there are some rural school districts in Maine that are so small that they don't have a public high school of their own. And so what Maine has done is it says for families, what you can do is you can either decide another public high school that's in another school district that's near you. You can sign a contract saying your, your kid can go there or we, the government, will give you funding to go to a private school. 
And so the, 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 the key thing that's an issue here is that when Maine gives that funding, they say we are not going to put, you cannot put this funding towards a school that has religious instruction. So the funding we're giving you to go to a private school can only go to a school that that uh, supports secular instruction. And so the question before the court is whether or not this program violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause. Um, and so the two sides, one you know, one side of the argument here, um, those challenging this law, saying it's unconstitutional, say that you're, you government are setting up a program where you're giving out government funding, and what you're doing is you're discriminating against schools that provide religious instruction. You're saying, we'll give the money to secular schools, but we won't give the money to religious schools. That's a form of discrimination against religious, uh, religious schools and religious people. As a result, it violates the First Amendment's free exercise clause. The other side, the state of Maine defends their law and says, look, what we're doing here is this is a unique circumstance. We don't have public schools in these school districts. What we wanna do with this school funding is to provide students with the same opportunity they'd have with a secular public education. And so this is meant as a simple replacement for what they'd be going, getting if we put public schools in their own school districts. We're not saying that we would never allow a religious organization to receive this money. What we are saying, though, is that if they, if they use the money towards, if, if, the, if the religious school also provides religious instruction, it can't get the money. And so it's all about preserving for the students and families the same opportunity they'd have if there are public schools in their school district. Fantastic. And one of the things that we try to do in this class is to remind us all that it starts with people. So when we're looking at these cases, I think Justice Kennedy said it once in a really impressive case on separation of powers. Don't get lost in the law. Don't get lost in the legislation. We have to remember that these people's lives were affecting. Um, and it was just such an unbelievable like comment and word. So we wanted to make sure we pulled it in. I'm going to go to the rifle case. And then there's a whole bunch of questions I'm going to weave into uh, the row case because most of them are around the, the opinion and a few other pieces. So let's do the right. Well, the, 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 maybe we should maybe we oh. should reserve row for the fourth, so we could just get the questions okay. there. And I can I'll do the other two before then, if that if you think that makes sense. Does that work? I think that sounds great. Do you want to actually do since they're kind of religion cases and and First Amendment cases? Do you want to do Kennedy next? Sure. Okay. So this is Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. This involves this uh, uh, assistant uh, football coach at a high school who has uh, undertaken voluntary prayer at the 50 yard line at the end of high school football games. And the key question here is whether or not this action is, you know, whether or not one, this action because he's uh, the employee of a public school district is government speech. If it's government speech, it's not protected by the first amendment. So that's sort of the first question. The second is if it is his own private speech, does the school district run into a problem if it allows the coach to pray on the 50 yard line because it runs the danger of looking like an endorsement of religion in violation of the First Amendment's establishment clause? And so the two parties here, what the, what the coach argues is this, this that the, the coach, uh, Coach Kennedy argues that the First Amendment protects his right to offer a brief, silent, solitary prayer of thanks at the end of his team's games. Um, that public school employees don't shed their constitutional rights to the schoolhouse gate. Um, and his prayers in this case are not part of his official duties, they're just his own private speech. So one, because they're his own private speech, not government speech, the First Amendment applies here. And two, the, the, the school itself cannot uh, keep him from praying voluntarily at the 50 yard line without violating the First Amendment's free exercise clause. And so that's sort of, that's the side on, that's what the coach is arguing here. On the other side, what the school argues is that when Kennedy's praying after the football games, everyone sees him as a coach. He's still carrying out his responsibilities there. And as a result, there's a danger for the school district that if it permits him to continue to pray at the 50 yard line, that it's gonna be seen as endorsing religion in violation of the First Amendment's establishment clause. So this is a case where you could see it falling in between both the free exercise and establishment clause. It requires the court to do some work in reconciling those two parts. Also, it argues that what, what the coach Kennedy here is doing, it's not his own private speech. He's still a football coach at the end of a football game, it's government speech. As a result, even at the threshold, the First Amendment doesn't apply to this speech. The government can regulate it however it would like. And then finally, there, they, they also advance two arguments having to do with the students in the school. One is a concern that in this context, if a coach is praying at the 50 yard line, the students themselves may feel coerced to join in it. And that it presents a First Amendment uh, religion clause problem. And then finally, 
it, there's a lot of debate between the two sides about the facts of this case and whether it really is just a silent voluntary prayer at the 50 yard line or whether or not there was more of a media spectacle and it wasn't so private and it wasn't so private, but it was more of a public display by the coach. And with that, the school district says, you know, the coach here, what he did was he did this as a public spectacle. He called media to cover it. He called upon people to join him at the 50 yard line. And what actually happens is it ends up, you end up having a bunch of people running to the 50 yard line and ends up endangering the safety of the students also on the football field. And as a result of that, the state has an interest to regulate. So here you see sort of the, the, the arguments on each side, each side drawing on certain uh, uh, strands of First Amendment doctrine to try to advance their arguments. I think this one is so interesting and I think it's totally going to hinge around the 50 yard line, <laughs> like the place. And we talk about, you know, First Amendment and time, place, manner all the time in these classes. Um, OK, we are zinging through these big cases. Let's do the rifle case next. We'll jump into that and then we'll go uh, wrap up with Roe. Yeah, so New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin is an important Second Amendment case about the right to keep and bear arms. Um, and so here it involves a New York law. Uh, New York generally prohibits the possession of firearms without a license. And it also doesn't allow people to publicly carry guns so that you can't just have a holster with your gun publicly displayed. But what it does permit is for, you to get, is for you to get a license to carry a concealed weapon outside of your home. The question here is, is, is about the constitutionality of New York's permitting scheme. And so there, there are a lot of states where getting a license for a gun is like getting a driver's license. You don't need any special justification. Basically, everyone can get it, but you do have to go through the process. And there are certain requirements. In New York, what New York requires is something more. It says that if you want a license to carry a concealed weapon outside of the home, you need a special need, a special reason. It can't just be that you generally want to defend yourself. You need to have some sort of special justification. And the question is whether or not that violates the Constitution. What the Supreme Court has said so far about the Second Amendment are two in two key cases, Heller and McDonald from roughly 10 years ago, was that one, the Second Amendment, the core right is, is it protects a right to self-defense in one's home. And so it used that to strike down handgun bans in Washington, D.C. and Chicago. Um, but, it, and, 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 but at the same time, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment right, like any other right, is not absolute. And so it is possible for certain gun regulations to pass muster. And so the big question in this case is whether or not the rulings in Heller and McDonald, which had to do with guns inside the home and the importance of self-defense, extend to activities outside of the home, like carrying a concealed weapon for purposes of your self-defense outside of your home. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I keep saying Roe instead of Dobbs. And the reason why is Roe is the case that leads to the next one that we're gonna talk about. But Tom, before we jump there, you did a great job in this case, kind of showing the, the cases that came before it and how this ruling can affect or expand or change those cases. So real quick, before we jump to the last case, in the Carson case, are, is, what would be the case that we would look at to say, this is how the Carson case could change the case before it or add to it? So there are there are sort of two key cases. You know, one is uh, Lock v. Davey, which was 2004, where the Supreme Court upheld a Washington State scholarship program that excluded students who were pursuing a degree in devotional theology. So the challengers in, in Carson v. Macon are saying, if, the, if you think that case is in the way of us winning, you should overrule it. The other key one is a case called Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue, which was just from last year. It involved the Montana scholarship program. What the court said there is that scholarship programs, government giving funding for kids to go to schools, it can't exclude religious organizations because they are religious organizations. But it, it reserved the question we have in Carson versus Macon, which is whether they can uh, exclude those schools because they have religious instruction. So sort of be, this, the first case had to do with what sort of an organization was it? This case had to do with the content of the curriculum. So it's sort of the ne natural follow-up case from uh, Espinoza. Thank you. And it, we, you know, we should be watching these cases and looking at these cases and looking at the cases that lead up to them that are different, that are comparable, because you're looking at all these pieces and this is how the, the justices do it too. They're not just coming in blind to a case. They're looking at previous cases that ask, the same question or similar questions and how they turned out. So real quick in the Kennedy, the football coach of the 50 yard line, what are some cases that we could look at and unpack to get to this, this case? So one case is uh, Garzet, Gar Garcetti versus Ceballos, which is from 2006. And that's the case that really says that if you're a government employee 
um, what you're doing. There's an expansive sense of it being government speech. Therefore, there's no First Amendment protection. And the government, in this case, the school, has a great deal of discretion to regulate what you're saying. Question is whether or not the court's going to reconsider Garcetti in any way or alter it in any way um, based on, on, on Coach Kennedy's challenge here. The other is that there are just a string of cases under the Establishment Clause going back to the famous school prayer cases like Engel versus Vital, speaking that, that speak to sort of the the, the, uh, the prayer in the school setting. And so the, the, the court could sort of reconsider how they think of those. Depend it all depends on how they decide to analyze Kennedy because it both, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, because it both implicates the First Amendment's free speech clause and its religion clauses. So there are a lot of options for how the court can decide that case. And as a result, which sort of cases it may, it may uh, which previous cases it may rely on or alter in certain ways. And now we get to the Dobbs case, which uh, Roe v. Wade is the previous case. Um, there's others as well, but tell us what's happening in the Dobbs case so we can kind of understand what the court is looking at directly. Yeah, so the, 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 the key question the court initially granted in this case was whether all pre-viability bans on abortion are unconstitutional. And so that's sort of, that's, that's the primary question. The second is whether the court should revisit and reconsider its precedents in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Those are the key cases that recognize a constitutional right to an abortion. And so it's sort of those two pieces working together. The specifics in this case is a law passed by Mississippi called the Gestational Age Act, which banned most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy with certain exceptions for medical emergencies or fetal abnormalities. The challenger in this case, Whole Woman's Health, was the lone abortion clinic in the state of Mississippi challenging this law. This law goes to sort of one of the big questions in constitutional law, not just this question of a right to an abortion, but more broadly, what sort of rights does the Constitution protect that aren't specifically listed in the Constitution? These are known as unenumerated rights. These are things like the right to privacy. There's no right to privacy clause in the Constitution. And justices and scholars over time uh, going all the way back to the founding have debated what sort of rights are protected in the Constitution, even if they aren't specifically written in there. And so Roe Ro versus Wade itself uh, was a gloss, it, it was a, 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 a follow-up to the case of Griswold versus Connecticut. Griswold versus Connecticut recognized a right to privacy. The court then in Roe v. Wade and eventually in Casey recognized a right to an abortion following naturally from that right to privacy. And so this case here is requiring the court to consider one, what sort of constitutional protection is there for abortion, reproductive rights in this context, in the constitution. So the big question, they have to think about that big constitutional question about unenumerated rights. And the other thing they have to consider is we have this line of cases on the books from Roe to Planned Parenthood versus, versus Casey. Roe is 50 years old. How do we deal with precedent? How do we deal with a previously decided case? Do we continue to follow it? Do we feel bound by it or should we overrule it? And so the court has to also think, so the court has to think through that first question of the constitution's meaning, the best reading of the constitution, but also that second question which is whether or not to overrule a longstanding precedent of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court does that sometimes, but it doesn't do it super often. And so it has to, it usually thinks really, really carefully before it does. Fantastic. Thank you for kind of laying them all out. What I'm going to do now and students, I know we're a little over, but there's a lot to unpack here. I'm going to run through some of the questions that are most associated with this case, and then I'll get to the other questions that were kind of like with the content is, I mean, the, with the uh, process as well as the modern cases. So the Have a Good Class um, asked, let's talk a little bit about um, the leak in this case. Um, what was the leak? And the Have a Good Class really wants to understand how do you think the collegiality between the, the court justices could be affected by the fact that this was leaked? Um, I'd like to know, you know, how is this common that, a, that an opinion is leaked? If you're in the middle of writing, I never want people to see my draft. So I can't even imagine like if that's normal, if that's not. And then another question from our students is how much of, you know, how much do we know about the leak? Were there, uh, you know, not just the writer of the opinion, but was there clear how many people were agreeing and how many people were disagreeing in that opinion? And was that, you know, at that moment or just an assumption? Sure. So this is uh, the, the leaked opinion draft in, in the Dobbs case uh, authored by Justice Samuel Alito. I could just say as someone who's followed the court closely and also filed briefs in the court uh, for, for my professional career, 
it's, I can't begin to describe to you how unusual, extraordinary, un, uh, uh, having a, a, an opinion draft leaked like this. You will see over time, sometimes there'll be like rumors and in innuendo about how the court may come down in a big case. That's not unusual, but to actually have the draft of an opinion out there in public like this, it's just so unbelievably unusual. You're right. That I, I love the question from the class because you're right. What this does threaten to do is threaten those norms of open communication between different justices. It could undermine the trust between them. There are all sorts of, from an internal perspective of the Supreme Court, you could certainly see it messing with the dynamics. Um, uh, you know, more broadly about the leaked opinion itself, it's a draft. Um, it's a draft from February. Um, so in all likelihood, that's about three months after the oral argument. Probably the, it's the first draft that's being circulated to the justices. Um, the, the reporting by Politico, uh, which is not based on anything written on the draft, but I guess based on communications with the leaker or other sources, was that a majority of the Supreme Court had signed on to Justice Alito's opinion. But the thing to note about that, again, is that opinion, opinion, the opinion itself and the votes themselves are not final until they're final. Justices don't, you know, they don't sign on until the end of the process, and it's not going to be announced until all the justices have completed their opinions and, and finalized their votes. And so that, there's a sense in which this process where the opinion itself could change, the content of it can change, it would be really extraordinary if there were no changes to an opinion. I think, you know, generally speaking, opinions change big and small through this iterative process we talked about. And furthermore, the votes can change over time based on once dissents have been distributed, once concurrences have been distributed, justices will have a better lay of the land of the different options that are out there of what sort of opinion they can sign on to. Um, so that process is still ongoing. And again, you would expect a case like Dobbs isn't going to come out until probably the last day of the term, likely at the end of June. Thank you, Tom. That was really helpful and kind of like unpack it and understand it. Um, the Rydell class wants to know what we think the answers to these cases, like how they'll come out. And I was saying, I don't know if I can give you that answer because sometimes we're as completely like struck by the, the way it's gonna come out as well. Uh, but I will say, at least I feel comfortable with the, the rifle case. I might, like from everything that I've read, it feels like they're gonna land on the side of saying that that permit process is not um, allowed, it is not fair. But that's, and Dobbs, I have no idea how Dobbs is going to come out. Uh, but Tom, I wanted to turn that back to you as well. I think I'm going to I'm going to punt on that one. Uh, you know, part of the reason why is that for a case even like the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case, a lot of what's going to be important is not just the votes and the ruling itself, but sort of how broad or how narrow it's going to be and sort of, you know, how many questions they're going to reserve for after that case. Um, you know, after Heller and McDonald's were both really, really big deals. Um, they, you know, they struck down handgun laws in, in big cities and they provided an important new gloss on the Second Amendment, but they retain like a ton of additional questions to be asked uh, in the years ahead. And so often when I'm watching these cases, I also have that in my mind too, is sort of how broad, how narrow, how big is the Supreme Court gonna go, how minimalist, what, and then importantly, what questions are gonna remain and what are sort of the scope of arguments that are available after that. And I think that's so unbelievably important and I love the way you answered that. Um, it's, the, it's all about the gray. You know, it's not black or white. It's not always clear and direct. And that's why it's so important to read the opinions and the dissents and the concurrences. Um, and also what you said in the beginning of the class, like it is not just the only way that the constitution is amended or changed, that there's all these factors. And what you get at the end of a ruling isn't all the answers at the same time. Sometimes it's just different pieces and different boundaries. And it's about how do we understand and look at how this applies to the, the laws and to the cases and the next set of questions. So Tom, thank you so much. Students, hang tight. We're gonna go through the questions. Just for this part, I just wanted to stop the live stream as we're answering direct questions just from you, but fantastic questions all the way through so far and we'll continue. Great, thanks everyone. And one thing